So hi, I'm Sid Costa. I'm a laryngologist, which means that I do medical and surgical treatments of voice, airway, and swallowing disorders. But I'm really obsessed mm -hmm. about the voice. So I, I am obsessed about the beauty of it and singing, about the science of it, how it affects our personality. So I call myself a voice nerd. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks to Lauren, I heard nerds are cool again. So I think, I say it's about time. So. Two things you may not know about the voice is, one, how important it is. And all my patients say that they don't realize how vital it is to their life until they lose their voice. The second thing is we don't know a lot about the mechanics of how the voice works, how the vocal cords vibrate or vocal folds vibrate, and how sound is produced. We have a lot of theories, but we don't have a lot of actual validation of those theories. And we'll talk about why that is. Dr. Gutmark and I run a lab where we look at aerodynamics and airflow in the upper airway and in the larynx to try to figure out questions like this. And I'm going to show how we take care of our most difficult patients, patients whose larynx have been completely destroyed and who have no vocal cords and very little normal tissue. We have to rebuild them. And in that, usually in laryngology, we assume that form equals function. So if you have abnormal form, like that big mass there, you just remove it, you get normal form, normal function. But that doesn't work when the vocal folds or cords are severely destroyed, because in that case, you don't have any form. So you have to build on an alternative form to give you the same function. And then it's important to know how the voice works. And for these patients who haven't talked for several months to several years, um, they just want to be understood in a noisy environment, over the phone, in a drive-through. So they want intelligibility and intensity. And believe it or not, the mechanics of that are still being understood. So what we can see is what you see on the left. These are the vocal cords vibrating. The top five show during opening, and the bottom five show during closing. It turns out that acoustically, the closing phase is the most important. Now what you can't see is a cross section of that. So the arrow is going from below the vocal cords to above. And your vocal cords are right underneath your Adam's apple. So the first five show it during opening and the second five show it during closing. And in closing, the bottom of the vocal cords is less wide than the top of the vocal cords. During opening, it's the opposite. But during closing, the cords take what we call a divergent shape because the width between their cords is greater on the upper edge. So this is a theory about how the vocal cords work. On the left, you see um, this is an excised larynx, which we use as a model. And we've made it so you can see the cords. And you can see how the bottom closes first. And there's a divergent shape. The theory here has a few things that that probably aren't true or that we're looking at. One is the, the vocal cords themselves are modeled as masses and springs and resistors. The second thing here, you see the, the convergent divergent shape, but the airflow is all straight. So the idea is during closing, which is very important acoustically, um, that airflow, when it's straight, it doesn't really produce any pressure. So the closing is produced mostly by you're compressing the cord spring when you open, and then it springs back when you close. So there's not much we can do as surgeons to change the material properties of the folds to get, to get better closing. So that doesn't help us. But if it turns out that the airflow is important, then that's very important. Um, and in aerospace engineering, we know that the airflow is very important, and that things called vortices, which Dr. Gutmark will talk about, actually can produce a lot of forces. Uh, the closing is important because a quicker flow shut off, here you see the flow going up during opening and going down during closing. You see it's a lot more rapid during closing. And the, more, the greater that shuts off, so the greater the flow goes from high to low, the louder the voice will be and the more intelligible the voice will be. So you can increase that shut off by, by increasing the forces causing closing or by increasing the velocity of airflow going out um, in the mid-closing phase. Dr. Gutmark? 
So uh, here comes the uh, curiosity of an engineer is why these things are uh, actually happening. And uh, we're watching the, uh, the video that uh, Dr. Costa just uh, shown you and we understand from Dr. Costa that it's very important to have this uh, rapid uh, shut off. So uh, we're trying to, as an engineer, understand why and what is, uh, how things uh, actually happen. Um, so we look at the um, uh, a kind, kind of a, um, a model that, uh, that, that develops uh, in there and uh, Dr. Kostler mentioned this um, uh, concept of vortices. Uh, vortices are very important uh, part of uh, aerospace applications. Uh, in many, uh, many areas you can watch them, for example, in the lower uh, right uh, picture you can see an airplane flying. Supersonic airplanes actually flying because vortices are creating uh, very low pressure on top of them and sucking them up into the air, uh, creating lift. Uh, if you have, um, uh, if you're waiting on a, a runway to take off, you don't want to take off too uh, fast after another one took before you because you have these vortices that are uh, on the way. If you build your house, you want to make sure that the roof is very well built because a tornado will suck it off. Um, so vortices really uh, create very uh, strong negative pressures and, um, um, and, can, uh, uh, and are very well known in applications uh, for engineering. Um, now, if we um, watch now and try to relate it to uh, what is happening in, a, uh, in the uh, larynx, in the gladys, you can uh, see in the upper picture here that um, the gladys just before closing, that's when we're trying to explain this very rapid closure, um, has a divergent um, uh, shape to it. And you can imagine maybe the flow looks like what the arrow shows, but actually it's known for aerodynamics that it's impossible. And the flow will tend to do maybe something like what is the second, the middle picture showing, that it will separate from the walls. But um, in between the jet and the walls, you'll start having some kind of a vacuum and has to be filled somehow. And uh, uh, the answer to this uh, question, what is really happening to this fault, come from what, it, what is actually filled in between and what are the vortices that are generated in between this jet and the walls and what kind of suction forces they are uh, applying. So um, we're using advanced uh, laser diagnostics to uh, study these kind of complicated flows and I'm not going to go into the details of all that, but there's very complicated hardware and software to find what is the speed associated with the vortices and what kind of forces they are applying uh, on the surrounding um, walls. And this uh, uh, ability to do it is, uh, has been uh, done in aerospace application for years now, but in the larynx, the problem is that you have an area that is smaller than your fingernail and you have to do all this analysis in that. Uh, and this is why it wasn't uh, known until now. And this is where we, where we came um, and actually showed that this happens. And each one of these pictures are extra larynx, uh, larynges of a uh, canine that are a very good model of a human larynx. And you can, you can see that each one of them has these uh, vortices uh, in between the middle jet and the, and the folds, and the, this is what is actually uh, causing this very high uh, suction force. So um, uh, compared to the current theory, which actually um, relies on the, um, on the spring and on the elasticity properties, which couldn't explain really what uh, is observed as a very fast uh, closure, these new theories that uh, we're, we were able to show that these vortices appear there and actually exist in all the different uh, models that we tested, these can provide this clue to the su strong suction force and a clue to what kind of uh, other uh, medical treatment can be used. So if you increase that divergence angle, you will increase the loudness. And so this is what we did in a normal larynx. Here I am making stuff up so you can listen to my voice. I don't have anything much to talk about, and none of the ideas really hit on. So, I'm not quite sure how long this is supposed to last either. Now, just because we can make you speak doesn't mean we can control what you say, so. <laughs> he had his larynx completely crushed in an explosion where 900 pounds of concrete fell on his neck, and he couldn't talk for several months. Now, here's a person who 
we did similar things to who had lost her voice for 35 years. Her story is over the net. And here she's talking about how her personality has changed now that she's had a voice 35 years later. I think a lot of times I felt, you know, because women were so bad, you know, they just, they would brush aside if you're not the status quo woman and, um, and you don't defend yourself because, you know, you don't have the voice to do it. I had one lady not too long ago, hmm. she says, oh, I thought you were just retarded. Can you believe that? So the outer voice and the inner voice are often related, which is just interestingly from a psychological and philosophical point. But that's, that's one example of how our research helps us help patients.